The World Wide Web, where you're likely watching this video, is used by millions of people every day for everything from checking the weather, ordering food, and chatting with friends, to raising funds, sharing news, or starting revolutions. We use it from our computers, our phones, even our cars. It's just there, all around us, all the time. But what is it exactly? Well, first of all, the World Wide Web is not the Internet, even though the terms are often used interchangeably. The Internet is simply the way computers connect to each other in order to share information. When the Internet first emerged, computers actually made direct calls to each other. Today, networks are all around us, so computers can communicate seamlessly. The communication enabled through the Internet has many uses, such as email, file transfer, and conferencing. But the most common use is accessing the World Wide Web. Think of the web as a bunch of skyscrapers, each representing a web server, a computer always connected to the Internet, specifically designed to store information and share it. When someone starts a website, they are renting a room in this skyscraper, filling it with information and linking that information together in an organized way for others to access. The people who own these skyscrapers and rent space in them are called web hosts, but anyone can set up a web server with the right equipment and a bit of know-how. There is another part to having a website without which we would be lost in the city with no way of finding what we need. This is the website address, which consists of domain names. Just like with a real-life address, a website address lets you get where you want to go. The information stored in the websites is in web languages, such as HTML and JavaScript. When we find the website we're looking for, our web browser is able to take all the code on the site and turn it into words, graphics, and videos. We don't need to know any special computer languages because the web browser creates a graphic interface for us. So in a lot of ways, the World Wide Web is a big virtual city where we communicate with each other in web languages, with browsers acting as our translators. And just like no one owns a city, no one owns the web. It belongs to all of us. Anyone can move in and set up shop. We might have to pay an internet service provider to gain access, a hosting company to rent web space, or a registrar to reserve our web address. Like utility companies in a city, these companies provide crucial services, but in the end, not even they own the web. But what really makes the web so special lies in its very name. Prior to the web, we used to consume most information in a linear fashion. In a book or newspaper article, each sentence was read from beginning to end, page by page, in a straight line until you reached the end. But that isn't how our brains actually work. Each of our thoughts is linked to other thoughts, memories, and emotions in a loose, interconnected network, like a web. Tim Berners-Lee, the father of the World Wide Web, understood that we needed a way to organize information that mirrored this natural arrangement. And the web accomplishes this through hyperlinks. By linking several pages within a website or even redirecting you to other websites to expand on information or ideas immediately as you encounter them, hyperlinks allow the web to operate along the same lines as our thought patterns. The web is so much a part of our lives because in content and structure, it reflects both the wider society and our individual minds. And it connects those minds across all boundaries, not only ethnicity, gender, and age, but even time and space. The internet actually got its start over 50 years ago, and computers back then filled up entire rooms. Scientists and researchers used it for years to communicate during the Cold War. It was useful because if one computer went down, the others wouldn't follow. In 1962, a scientist named J.C.R. Lickletter proposed the idea of a network of computers that could talk to one another. In 1969, the first ever message was sent from one computer to another over the ARPANET, the government's computer network at the time. ARPANET stands for Advanced Research Projects Agency. One was located in a research lab in UCLA and the other at Stanford. All the message said was log in, and it didn't fail to crash the network. Stanford only received the first two letters of the message, but hey, you gotta start somewhere. By the end of the year, only four computers were connected to this network. In 1971, the University of Hawaii's Aloha Net was added, followed by various networks in London and Norway two years later. Also happening in 1971, Ray Tomlinson was developing the first system to send mail back and forth between the users of ARPANET. This would eventually be called electronic mail or email for short. The at 
symbol was used to tell a person's name and the host name apart. With all of the networks floating around, there needed to be a way for all of the computers on them to communicate with other networks. This is where computer scientist named Vinton Cerf comes in. He invented a way to introduce computers across the globe to each other in a virtual space. This invention was called Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which was followed by Internet Protocol, or IP. In the 80s, scientists used Cerf's protocol to send data back and forth, but the 90s is where it really all began. In 1991, a computer programmer named Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. This wasn't just a data sharing space for scientists anymore, this was an entire network of information that was accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Now you're using a browser right now to watch this video, and some of the popular ones are Firefox, Google Chrome, and Safari, but in 1992, Erwise was created. Erwise was an internet browser and the first to have a graphical interface. A few browsers came before and after, but in 1993, Mosaic was created, and it would popularize surfing the web. Mosaic influenced many of the browsers to follow, including including Netscape Navigator in 1994. This became the most popular web browser at the time, accounting for 90% of the web usage in 1995. In the early 90s, companies like AOL and CompuServe were starting to provide dial-up internet access. Dial-up is a method of connecting to the internet via a telephone line. Your telephone line was plugged into a modem, and the other end was plugged into the phone jack. There was a period in history where you couldn't use your telephone and the internet at the same time. Without the internet, we obviously wouldn't have things like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, but way Way more importantly, we wouldn't be able to access information in seconds. We wouldn't be able to communicate with people from around the world, share ideas, and educate those who might not get a chance elsewhere. Also without the internet, I'd actually have to talk to someone when I order a pizza, which by the way, was the first thing ever purchased on the internet. How would your life be different without the internet? So, in this video, we are going to look at the basics of web applications, or how the web applications work. First of all, Let's understand what's called a web application. A web application is a piece of software which can be accessed from a browser. And you know what's called a browser. Uh, a browser is an application that you use for browsing the internet. And the examples are your IE or Firefox or Google Chrome or Safari. You all know about that. Technically speaking, we can call a web application a web server, although there is a difference in the sense that a web server can host multiple web applications. But for the time being, let's call a web application a web server. And a web server is actually a network application running on some machine listening on a port. The browser is actually called a web client, or more formally, we call that a user agent. And in fact, web clients are not only browsers, but any application which can speak to a web server, like your CURL or Telnet, those are also web clients or user agents. So the web client or the user agent communicates with the web server to get its job done. And for this communication, and actually for any communication, both the parties need to use the same set of rules or grammar which we call protocol in technical terms. Uh, you got what is called a protocol? It's simple like when two parties are communicating, for example when two people are communicating they need to use the same language and the same set of grammar rules so that they can understand each other. Similarly in computer uh, science when two applications are communicating, they, use, they need to use the same set of rules, which we call protocol. And the browsers can speak some standard protocols, like the HTTP protocol, the FTP protocol, the WebSocket protocol. Uh, there are many protocols which the browsers uh, can speak, and they are standards. And each of these protocols are suitable for different kind of tasks. For example, the FTP protocol is used for transferring files. And among all these protocols, the HTTP protocol is the most used protocol in the web client and the web server club. That means uh, most of the times the web client and the web server speak to one another using the HTTP protocol. And in fact, in this uh, a whole tutorial we are going to focus only on HTTP protocol. So let's dig somewhat more into the HTTP protocol. Uh, to understand HTTP protocol we need to start or let's start with what is called a 
web resource or a resource as commonly said. A resource is a document like an HTML document or a PDF document or a JSON document or an XML file or any kind of document which is hosted by a web server or in other words a web client can access uh, those documents through a web server. A resource could be either static or dynamic. A resource which does not change is called a static resource. That means uh, it's like uh, some static file sitting in the web server's hard disk or sitting somewhere which the web server has got access to and when a request for a resource comes from a web client, the web server passes that resource to the web client straight. In contrast, a dynamic resource is generated on the fly in the sense that uh, when a request for a dynamic resource comes from a web client, the web server uh, builds the resource on the fly. For example, suppose a web server has a resource which embeds the current time either in a JSON or some XML document or an HTML page or whatever. So when a request for that particular resource comes from a web client, the uh, web server uh, gets the current time from the system and puts that into a JSON document, builds a JSON document or an XML document or an HTML document embedding that particular time into it and then it sends back that document to the web client. Each resource on the web in the world is identified by a unique URL which is actually a unique string. Uh, it would be more clear when we look at an example. So uh, this is an example of a URL which points to a unique resource in the world and this part of the URL is the protocol and this part identify the web server in the world and this is the path of the resource in the web server. We will talk about URL more in some later video. Let's go back to HTTP now. So, HTTP protocol is basically a request response protocol. That means Whenever the web client needs to do some operation on a resource like reading it or updating it or deleting it or creating a new resource or any kind of operation, the web client first establishes a connection with the web server where the resource is hosted and then the web client sends a request to it. The request contains the details of what the web client wants like which operation it wants and all. While the web server receives a request, it responds with a response back to the web client. That means it sends a response back to the web client. And the content of the response depends on what was requested. For example, if the client asks to read a resource, the server can either put the resource in the response or inform the client that the resource is not available with me and you go to somewhere else for the resource or something like that. And then, after the response is given to the web client, the connection is closed and the web server does not remember anything about the past connections and who the clients were. That means, next time, if the client sends another request to the server, the web server will treat that request as a new request coming from a new web client. And because of this nature, the HTTP protocol is called a stateless protocol. And this one pair of request and response is called an HTTP transaction. So this was a basic overview of how web servers and web clients work. So what is an HTML? HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. HTML is a set of specifications for creating documents that a browser can display as a web page. Hypertext means a document that is linked to a related material 
using a hyperlink. HTML is called a markup language because the author leaves its marks, called HTML tags. This is to specify how the document should look like. So for example, h1 tag is used for headers, title tag is used for a title, p tag is used for paragraph. To see all the tags that you can possibly use, go to w3schools.com under HTML tag list. Ultimately, HTML is the language of the web. This is what the browser reads and understands, so it can display the creative designs of each web page. Let us talk about what an HTML document is. HTML document is just like a Word document with text. However, in an HTML document, the author can specify the color, the size, the position of every single word or element in the document to customize it. There are a few ways to create an HTML document. You can use Word, Notepad, an online tool such as Weebly, WordPress, and Google website. Or you can also use local software for a cost such as Adobe Dreamweaver or a free software such as Composer and Amaya. Computers use language to communicate just like people do. And the way computers communicate with the internet is through a computer language called Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML. Hypertext is the process of linking objects to each other so that when one object is clicked, the linking object can be viewed. And the Hypertext Markup Language was created by Tim Berners-Lee in 1990 so that the hypertext could be used through the internet. Web pages doesn't make you a programmer. Instead, the hypertext markup language contains a series of markup tags that are used to classify and group elements in a web page. A web browser then reads these markup tags and translates them into what we visibly recognize as a website. Most web browsers allow you to view the HTML code for any web page. For instance, in Firefox you can hit Control u on Windows or Command u on a Mac to bring up the web page source. You'll probably notice some words surrounded by angled brackets. These are the markup tags. All web pages must consist of certain markup tags before they can be legitimately considered web pages. These are the HTML tag, which tells the browser that it's reading an HTML page, the head tag, which contains scripts, the page title, and meta information for search engines, and the body tag which contains the visible web page content. For the most part, each tag has a corresponding closing tag so that the web browser knows when to stop reading the tag. Tags can also have attributes that add extra parameters to the element, like styling attributes such as color, alignment, and things like that. These are generally denoted by having the attribute name, an equal sign, and then the attribute value in quotation marks. There are many options out there for creating websites. Some are free and some are very expensive. Programs such as Dreamweaver allow you to drag and drop what you want, where you want it, without ever having to see an ounce of code. These editors are called WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get editors. But to code a website from scratch, all you really need is a text editor such as Notepad for Windows or TextEdit for Mac and a web browser, and that's it. So that's pretty much the basics of what HTML is all about.